Let us come to the reading of the scriptures. If you turn with me to Psalm uh, 73 and reading from verse 16 through to the end of the psalm. This is a, a psalm which begins the, um, uh, the third book of psalms. Uh, there are, there's one book of psalms and yet there are three divisions, there are five divisions to it in fact. And this is the beginning of the third section. It is a psalm of Asaph, uh, who uh, was a, a leader of the singing uh, in, the, uh, in the worship of the temple. And so uh, it's a psalm which uh, not only was one which could be sung very happily, but it was also an expression of his own personal testimony. And we find in the first uh, 15 verses his great concern about what he's observing. And we'll have reason to look at that as we come to expound it in a moment. But now we come to the part where he resolves his issues. And reading at verse 16 in Psalm 73, uh, we see something of the way in which uh, Asaph, uh, the, uh, the worship leader, uh, discovers something of the mercy and the grace of God. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. And thus far, in the reading of God's word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now to ask you to teach us from the scriptures. We will never understand anything by nature, for by nature we are benighted. But, O Lord our God, by the work of your spirit, you open our eyes to see wondrous things in your word. Teach us how to apply those things to ourselves. And let us be so moved by what we learn that our lives might be transformed. We pray these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I wonder how many of you are ever frustrated. Frustrated, maybe by your husbands, your wives, maybe you find your husband sometimes a little frustrating. You ask them to do something and they say, yes, dear, yes, dear, and, uh, and it's never done, dear. It, it's forgotten. Or maybe you're frustrated by your, your wives. Uh, you know, you said to them, I am going here, I'm going there, will you come with me? And they say, yes, I'll be there, and then comes the hour, and they're not ready. <laughs> Do I hear a laughter? <laughs> I speak to somebody's experience anyway. Yeah. Are you frustrated by your children? Are you frustrated by your parents, your children? Your parents just don't measure up. And you parents, are your children disappointed? There are so many things that frustrate them, aren't they? We're frustrated by our jobs, we're frustrated by our homes, we're, we're frustrated by everything. 
And we're frustrated by providence, the things that happen in the world. I, I know for my own part that um, as you hear of, of the things that go on both in our country and overseas, I am, I am frustrated. You know, why doesn't God act? Why doesn't he deal with situations that are glaringly unjust and wicked? Why doesn't he? Because, of course, we not only get frustrated by providence and by circumstances, but we get frustrated by God. Because God doesn't act on our time frame. He doesn't work on the things that we see as though what we see are the last things that need to be done. And if only he would do them, we would have a successful, happy, contented universe. Why doesn't he do this or do that? You hear of the terrible persecution of Christians. Why doesn't he deal with them? Why doesn't he send a bolt out of heaven? We get frustrated with God. It doesn't seem that he can see what we can see. <laughs> you know, wouldn't it be so much better if we ran the world? We get frustrated with God. And this is what's true of this psalm we have before us. The psalmist Asaph uh, begins by saying that God is good. And then he goes on to say, what frustrated him? He's frustrated by the unbelief of people. Listen to him. For I was, en and as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. How many of us have said that? People who seem to have no concern about God and they make millions. They're successful in everything they do. There is no end to their, uh, to their abilities and, and, and to their uh, um, successes. And they seem to behave as though there is nothing to fear. They live, they're in the prime of life. Uh, uh, men in their 20s or in their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. And they're in the prime of their lives. And they, whatever they touch, it seems to turn to gold. And yet their lives are scandals of wickedness and debauchery. Their bodies are fat and sleek, he says. He is really... Seeing them for what they really are. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not strictly like the rest of mankind. They seem to be so successful. There is no, their pride just is about them like a necklace. You know, uh, ladies wear necklaces and they are objects very often of great beauty. Whereas their pride is about their necks. And violence covers them like a garment. This... This is, this is the, uh, the wicked, and, and he is, on one part, envious. I suggest to you that he's envious, but certainly he's frustrated that they're not being brought down <coughs> to size. And then he goes on to tell us that such behavior, in verses 13 and 14, it's such behavior frustrates his own attempts of purity. <clears throat> Look, all in vain, I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning, as if I said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. His conscience bothers him because on the one hand, he sees the success of the wicked, he sees, on the other hand, how much he wishes it was his success. But he knows that he cannot desire that because it would be in opposition to the, to the people of God. And then God deals with him. And it's that lesson that he does that we see here in the verses under our consideration. So we begin then by seeing where he begins to learn 
the true situation. You see, we don't see things as they really are. We tend to think that because we are human beings brought up in Western society with the advantages of good educations, I'm sure every one of you here went to school. Uh, some of you are still going to school. All the rest of us went to school. They, we were taught to read and write, and, uh, and, and we can read, and we can study things, and, and we have possessions, and, and, and we think that we've, we've accomplished everything. And, and we are in p complete possession of what is necessary for us. And yet, says the psalmist, that just isn't the case. Look, he says, until when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a weariness, a wearisome task. How can this be? How many of you felt like that? How can it be? Why is it all going on like this? How can it be? Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. You see, this is what's happened. The importance of the house of God. Now, we're in the house of God. It isn't the same house of God that Asaph, I think, I suggest to you, had in mind. It was the temple. But for us, we come here week by week. And we come here, it's very much uh, the way we live our lives. Uh, it, it, it's a part of our routine. It, you know, uh, every week without a Sunday is a, is a lost week. How many of you felt that, you know, I wasn't getting able to get to church. and It, it just seems like a lost week. But, but there's more to it than that. We come to the house of God to learn something. This is what happened to him. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, it seemed impossible for me to make sense, to, to blend these things together, to fit it all together, to see the success of, of wickedness and debauchery and, 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 and unbelief. And they seemed so prosper, prosperous and, and successful. And now I go to the house of God. The, the, the last place. You know, he didn't go to a bar. He didn't go to a, uh, to a, um, uh, uh, a concert. He didn't go to a, um, a, uh, anything that, that wasn't uh, the place of God. And he goes to the house of God. And what does he find? Well, he finds, first of all, what God has got to say to him. It's not what he's got to say to God. God knows full well what he's saying. It's what God has got to say to him. And when you come into this place, as you go to any other place, it's what God has got to say to you. And you need to listen. Because this is God speaking. When God's word is opened, it's God that's speaking to you. It's not me. It's God. You may say, well, you're making enough noise. It must be you. No, no. I'm trying to tell you what God is saying to you. And what is God saying to them? He is preaching the word. They went into the, the house of God. And whatever went on in their house of God, there was worship and there was psalm singing and there would be addresses of different kinds and there were sacrifices and all those things. But they all spoke powerfully from God. And so it is for us. We come to the house of God. And first of all, this is the act of worship. The very act of worship. When we join together to sing God's praise. And we should always join together with enthusiasm. We not come here to, oh, here we go again. We sang this hymn three weeks ago. Here we are again, the same thing. What's wrong with this chap? Picking the same, we, I'm, I'm, I, I don't like these German melodies. I, I, oh, I just, do you come to worship in spirit and in truth? Those are the words of Christ. They that worship me in spirit and in truth. Do you come to hear God's word declared? Because whichever way Asaph would have heard the word of God, he would have heard it in whatever scheme that was used. Because when he went to the house of God, the sanctuary of God, the very name he gives it, tells us something of its nature. 
It's a place of safety. It's a place to flee to. And there he would have heard what God has to say to him. Do you come to the house of God to be corrected? Do you come to the house of God to be instructed? Do you come to the house of God to be informed? Or do you come to the house of God because that's the way you were taught? Because you see, if you've done that, you will fail. But you must come to hear what God has got to say to us. Because that's what happens to him. God has something to say to him. And what he discerns is of fundamental importance to the way in which he reacts to the frustrations that he faces. <coughs> and what does he discover? Well, he discovers the inevitable fate of the wicked. The inevitable fate of the wicked. No, it's not a, a probable fate, a possible fate. It's the inevitable fate that a man or a woman who doesn't repent of their sins are faced with the inevitable fate of death. Then I discerned their end. Oh, you know, that's chilling. When I first read these words many, many years ago, it had that chilling effect on my heart. There I discerned their end. The end. He doesn't say, well, qualifies it, you know, the end may be. No, no, he says, this is their certain end. This is absolutely certain that if they continue in this way, their hearts uh, wearing pride like a necklace, uh, violence cover them like a garment, eyes swell through with fatness, their hearts overflowing with follies, scoffing and speaking malice, loftily they threaten oppression. <clears throat> Look, he says, inevitably, inevitably, this is their end. Truly, you have set them in slippery places. See, they, they're not as confident or they're not as sure as they think they are. The ungodly are not half as safe as they think they are. You see, what he's discovered is the whole counsel of God. <coughs> this is everything that God is doing. At this moment, he might not be doing what you want him to do, but God is doing what he wants to do, and he knows what he's doing. And those people who incur his wrath and lie beneath his, his, his justice and his judgment are certain to endure the judgment of God. This is something that they must needs learn. And we all need to learn. We've got nothing to envy the ungodly. You mustn't envy the ungodly. You mustn't think that they are better off than you are. That they've got a better lot in life. They have not. They are indeed under the judgment of God. And you may desire for one minute to be like them. You young people, you children, you might say, well, I wish I was like my friend that uh, his father brings him to school in, in, in his Rolls Royce or in his, um, uh, or whatever car he has. Uh, um, and, and, and they live in this huge house and, uh, and he's got a, a pool table and a table tennis table and, uh, and everything in his basement. And, and he's living in the most luxurious, oh, if only my home was, oh, my dad was like that. Let me tell you, you haven't understood that their end is sealed. If they do not repent, if they do not come to Christ, they are certainly on a slippery slope. He says, you have set them in slippery places. Our saying, slippery slope, comes from this, this psalm. You have set them in slippery places, and you make them fall to ruin. They are destroyed in a moment. They are swept away by utter terrors. God is going to deal with them. And he will deal with them in such a way that will be permanent. There will be no coming back. 
They can't pay a price and then be restored after a period of purging in purgatory. No such thing. God has set it clearly before them that they will be judged and the judgment will be horrendous. You know, there was a time, I don't know if it was true in, in America, but perhaps it was, but certainly it was true in my country that there was a lot of what's called hellfire preaching. Talk, people talked about hell and judgment and, uh, and it became unfashionable, you know. I mean, it's so crude, it's so lacking in finesse. I mean, there's so much better ways of describing things and talking about judgment. We don't need to do that. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You know, if you were driving along the road on your way home tonight and you saw a sign which said, uh, driving recklessly could result in grave eschatological consequences. <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> well, you might not be able to read it, but apart from that, what would you say? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what are they putting these notices up for? What it really means is, if you don't drive carefully, you will die. When there's a hole in the road, you don't expect them to put a sign up and say, danger, there is a, a slight uh, deviation in the surface of this road. There's a hole in the road. <laughs> the one is very smooth, but totally inadequate to describe what you're really facing. And certainly the psalmist has seen that this is a terrible situation that the ungodly are to be found in. We've got to understand that what we are seeing is a fate that is incredibly terrible. It's the inevit inevitable fate of the ungodly. But in the third place, we see in verses, uh, 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 in verses 20, 23 through on to, uh, to verse uh, 26, he is brought to see himself. You may think, well, you know, that's fine. He's seen what's going to happen to the ungodly. That's solved his problem. No. God says you've got to see yourself. Look, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He's seen himself. Actually, it begins earlier in verse 21. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in my heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. He's going to see himself. This is what God does in the house of God. He not only tells you of what men's fate is like. He brings you to see yourself. You know, there are lots of things that you're quite happy to look at, but looking at yourself is something else. You know, if somebody is always in the mirror preening themselves and combing their hair, like a 16-year-old boy going out to school or going down the street, I mean, you say, you know, that's kids' play, that's just messing around. None of us think that we need to see ourselves for being exactly like that. And that's what God is showing him. He's showing himself for what he really is like. He was brutish. He was like a beast. And you know beasts, they always look downwards. I've never seen a cow. And I've seen many cows. I've never seen a cow looking up to the sky. And staring at the stars. Never. Never. Lived on a farm for all my early years. Never saw a cow looking up into the sky. Never saw a horse looking up. Not a sheep. Not a pig. Not one of them. A brute looks down. He's always looking downwards. And he's realized he's just brutish. He hasn't understood that beyond... The skies, there is a God who lives. 
that he is looking at a world that is limited because he hasn't understood that there is a God who is there and he's brought him to see himself and to see that he needs to be with him. I'm continually with you, he says. That's where I am. I am not outside of your covenant of grace. I belong within your covenant. I belong to your people. You are one of those. I am one of those for whom you have given your life. You've sent your son to die for me. That's who I am. And instead of me thinking only of myself and of my own offence and of my, my own frustrations and, and my own ambitions, I am now face to face with who I really am. I am brutish and ignorant. And I belong with you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He brings him to a reaffirmation of who he is and what he believes. You see, out of this dark pit in which the psalmist found himself, God has brought him not simply to understand what's true for those people whom he once admired, he's now come to see what God is doing with him, showing him himself. And bringing him to the joy of redemption in Christ. And then he's brought again to see his own attitude. And to look at his own attitude in terms of his continued walk with God. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. <coughs> Isn't that a warning? Behold, those who are far from you shall perish. And those doleful words? You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. Take those words seriously to mind. Any one of you who isn't a Christian tonight, any one of you, young, old, rich, poor, male, female, whichever one of you, take those words to heart. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. If you're unfaithful to God tonight, if you're not living for his glory, then God will put an end to you. And unless you make your peace with God, listen to the closing words, but for me it is good to be near God. This is what he's calling you. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell all your works. That you would declare God's greatness, God's goodness, God's authority, God's wisdom. That you would bear a testimony to him. When you go out to work tomorrow, who are you? Are you someone who is envious of the people that work around you? Or are you going to be one of those who declares God's great wisdom? Let me say some things by way of application. First thing is this, frustration is born of pride, self-righteousness, and envy. Are you frustrated? Then I'm telling you why you are. It's born of pride. If only people did things my way. Do you know anything like that? Did you ever think that? If only your children had done things you away. Fathers, and I'm one, have often thought to myself, if only these boys did what I did. They'd be perfect. <laughs> They'd be great. And I speak as an abject failure. <coughs> Any of you, you mothers, you know, if only my daughter did things the way I taught her to do it. But she, she will do them her own way. She, she just, ah, oh, well, there you are. What's the point? It's born, frustration is born of pride, of self-righteousness. You know, you're always right. <coughs> and envy. 
And that's why we get so frustrated with the world in which we live. That's why we cannot understand what's going on around us. That's why we are so troubled by the things that we see. It's not because they are troublous in themselves. Our God is on his throne. He rules over everything. Everything is in the palm of his hand. And he is king and lord of the earth. But we've lost that. Because we think if only we had power. If only we could do things. And it's important for us to understand that if we are going to deal with our frustrations, then we have to deal with our pride, our self-righteousness, and our envy. Because ultimately we are envious of the wicked. We envy their success. How many of you have lain in bed at night and when people win, uh, you know, $500 million on the, um, on the lottery, how many of you have lain in bed in the night and thought, if only it had been me? <laughs> really? None of you have ever done that? Oh, that's wonderful. Perfect church. And they call us that. I know only too well that I've often thought that. What would I do with 500 million? Well, of course, I'd pay off Shiloh's debt. I mean, that would be my first thing. I'd pay for all my children to have magnificent houses. I'd pay for it in a minute. 500 million, I mean, I scarcely made a dent in it. Give 100 million to the missions. Oh, they'd never have to have a thank offering from now until ever. What could I do? What could I do? Envy. And ultimately, disaster. First of all, because <coughs> there's nothing you want to do. You want other people to do it. You want to be having given into your hand. And the second thing is, of course, that you give people all these things and they don't improve at all. You never improve. I remember when I was in my last church, I, <coughs> I went to visit a couple. And um, they were telling me about a church just on the road from where we were. And uh, somebody had just given them a gift of um, $100,000. They said, isn't that wonderful? I said, disastrous. They said, what? I said, disastrous. If people have got $100,000 in the bank, they don't feel they need to give anything. They can tell them, go and get out of the $500,000. You don't need to pay your minister. You don't need to pay for anything. You just use up what you've got. I said, no. The church is more profitable when it works on the offerings of its people. It's not having great sums of money. It's learning to pray and to lean on God. They looked at me as though I'd hit them over the side of the head with a two by four. And a couple of days later, they called me. The wife called me. She said, you were right, Pastor Hughes. You were right. You were right. Because they'd been talking to people from this church and they said, well, we don't need, need to worry anymore. We don't have to worry about offerings. We don't have to worry about anything. We've got money in the bank. People with envy and, uh, and, and, and pride will never serve God well. The second thing is this. Being humbled by God's word is to see the real issues. This is what uh, the psalmist sees. He sees the real issues. It isn't that uh, they are fat and sleek. The real issues is are, the real issues are, that they have no eternal hope. That's their problem. Then I discerned their end. They couldn't see things as they really were. And when we're humbled by God's word, we will see things as they really are. You will never understand anything. Your family, your husband, your wife, your children, you'll not understand anything. The world, the nation, 
You'll not understand a thing until you've been humbled by God's word. And then you see things for what they really are. Things are really as God has ordered things. And the only place to turn is to turn to God and to call upon his name. To plead with him. And to ask him to show you what the end is really like. He went to the house of God and I discerned that and he saw it for what it really was. Is this true for you? Do you come to the house of God to discover what God has to teach you? Or do you come to the house of God in order to feed your pride? Or to feed your self-confidence? Or to feed uh, your self-righteousness? Or do you come to the house of God to really find what God has got to teach you? The third, third thing is this. Seeing everything with a divine perspective is the way of the word. What does God teach us in his word? You see, he doesn't teach us in, in his word to go somewhere else for light. He teaches us in his word to see things with a divine perspective. Seeing things from God's standpoint. You know, that's the difference between the world and the church, the believing church. The church sees things from God's standpoint. What is God seeing? And we understand that, not because we've got mystical understanding, it's because we've got God's word. And that shows us the world as it really is. And what we need to do is to see things from the divine perspective. We are blind if we cannot see it. We are battling off for no reason. You know, I've talked to people and I've told them things from a divine perspective and they've cried. Not, not, not because they were so glad to hear what I had to say, but because they thought I was being ruthless and painful. But the truth is the divine perspective is the only perspective by which to view the world in which you live. Your relationships, your friends, your work, uh, your neighbors, your, your church. When people have viewed things from a divine perspective, it's changed the world. This denomination exists because men looked at things from a divine perspective. It was true for Machen. It was true for Van Til. All these men <coughs> saw things from a divine perspective. It wasn't because they were unique. It wasn't because they were the only ones. I don't know all the names. But I do know that they exemplify how men saw things from the word of God. The same was true in the 1970s for the PCA. There were men who saw things from a divine perspective. What does God's word say? And so it must be for you and for me in the lives that we lead. If we would see things with a divine perspective, it would change our discontent, our frustrations, and our annoyances, and make us realize this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. And the last thing is this. A real self-recognition is dealt with in corporate worship. Having a divine understanding, self-recognition. When you recognize yourself, well, then you are comforted in, in worship. You see yourself for what you really are. You see yourself as a sinner. You see yourself as a needy, helpless soul. You know that you must have aid from high. And this comes to us as God deals with us in his word. This is what happened to the psalmist. He came and he saw things as they really were. He saw judgment as it really was. People don't like talking about judgment, but judgment there was. Look, he says, I discern their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. He saw judgment. It makes sense to him now because he's come to the house of God. It straightens out 
our whole life when we worship with fellow believers and when we call upon God and he brings his spirit in his word to teach us. Here we find the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we find the mercies of heaven. The psalmist is talking about the Lord Jesus. Look, he says, it's good for me to draw near to God. What's he talking about? Emmanuel, God with us. As we are with God, God is with us. I have made the Lord God my refuge. I've turned away from all the offerings of a pathetic world. And I've come to God. And as you face a, a week before you, just remember that. Either you set your face on what God would have of you to do. Or you turn your back on God and you will endure the consequences. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God and Heavenly Father, we ask you tonight to teach us what it means to see your word for what it really is and that we would be blessed and helped as we seek to live our lives in the light of eternity, seeing everything with your eyes and being able to live to the glory of your name. We pray this for Jesus' sake.